typing, I'm not quite sure. Whatever way, right, so we have strong ducks, yeah? <laughs> well, no, it's not going to be with that. And the title remains kind of confusing, but actually, I don't really want to explain the title quite yet. I want to give a bit of context first. But I'm going to say, this is not a talk that's all to do with ducks. So let's start by building a duck. Now, I've got to say, I'm not a professional duck builder. So before I can start to build a duck, I've really got to answer the question, how do you build a duck? I haven't built ducks before, but I have built other things, other non-duck related things. And I know that to build something, you really need to understand what it is you're building. So the question really becomes, what is a duck? Now, I'm not a complete idiot, I've got some idea what a duck is. But my past experience suggests that I don't know it in enough detail. So you need to kind of understand the duck in a lot of detail before you can build it. Now, again, my experience suggests that I can't hold all of that detail on my head in one go. I need to break it down into smaller, more manageable chunks. So I guess the final thing I need to do before I build a duck is to deconstruct a duck, to break it up into these smaller, more manageable chunks. Now, luckily for me, ducks are pretty common. It's going to be quite easy to find some kind of reference material. So I've chosen this chart. This is a mallow. This is a pretty typical duck. I'm going to kind of break this down into manageable chunks so we can build it up again. Now, I don't build ducks for a living, but I do write Ruby, so I like to think that I understand the important aspects of a duck. I know it's got a walk like a duck, and it's got a quack like a duck. So we can find those bits. We can find a bit of dust of quacking, and we can find a bit of dust of walking. But that doesn't really cover much of the duck. There's still a whole, a whole load of duck left on the carpet floor. Now, I know that ducks float, so maybe we've got a floating bit. I know that ducks fly as well, so we've got a flying bit. Now, there's not much detail there, but it covers enough the duck that I'm confident I can take this and start to reconstruct the duck. So it's good to go. So we can start with the quacky bit, which I think looked a little bit like that. And then we had the walking bit, which looked a little bit like that. And then the floating bit, and then finally the flying bit. So this is our duck. And it's a pretty rubbish duck. But this is my first attempt, I mean, we, we can refine this. Now, one of the things that I noticed when looking at this is we have all this negative space. And this wasn't here in the original duct that we looked at. So I'm going to do what any good developer will do at this point, and I'm going to remove the white space, or in this case, the black space. And we get this instead. Now, this is still a pretty rubbish duct. Um, the next thing that really strikes me is that all these joints are really jarring. The thing doesn't fit together very well. So I'm going to look at these connections and think, you know, we can improve this. I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, well, everything attaches to the floaty bit. So maybe if we change the shape of the floaty bit, this will fit together much better. So we can do that. We can put something in place to support the quacky bit. And then we can put a little support in place for the flying bit. And then finally, we can put something in place for the walking bit. So we'll get up with this. And this is still a pretty rubbish duck. But there's nothing obviously wrong with what we've done at the moment, except it doesn't really look like a duck. So I'm going to go back to our original source duck, which is this guy. And I want to just concentrate on the quacking bit. Now, if we take the quacking bit that we built and superimpose it, we get something that looks like this. And it's not a very good fit. It's too big, it's the wrong angle. So we can improve it. And then yeah, we get something like that, which is still not quite right, but it's a much better approximation. So if we take this and put it back in our original duck, we get this. Now, I've improved the shape of the quacky bit, but overall, our duck is worse. And it's worse because it doesn't really link up properly. Now, I can fix this, obviously. If you look at the floaty bit, we can see the angle is wrong and this thing sticks up too far. And of course, we can just repair that. And it's easy to do, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Something isn't quite right here. And what happened was, I went back to my source and I changed the quacky bit to be more accurate. And I thought this would make everything better. But this forced me to also change the floaty bit. And that's kind of weird, I wasn't trying to change the floaty bit, this was forced upon me. This is just really bad coupling creeping in. So I'm not going to get too excited about that, but I want to bear it in mind as we go on. Look at our duck, I mean this is still a shit duck, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe let's look at improving this. And when we last looked, we looked at the quacky bit. I was thinking, actually there's all this detail being missed around there. We've got the neck bit, and the brain bit, and the eye bit, and these are all missing from our model. So I'm going to go and add them into the model. And, uh, <laughs> it's not quite right, we need to move the quacky bit, so we'll move it up to there. 
and those seem fish then thinking, this is great, we've made a bit of progress, this looks more like a duck than it did previously. But actually it's hiding a problem. I mean, we, we cause some serious damage, and if I highlight the floating bit, you can see what the problem is. We have this thing sticking up into the neck. So we built the duck, but it's going to die some slow, horrible, lingering death. <laughs> Now, it's probably not what we want, unless we've got some duck sadists here, but we have, I think, asked you to leave, please. Um, now, we can easily fix this. We can just remove it, okay? Because this is going to be very bad for a duck, so we can just get rid of it. So that's fine, but this is the second time it's happened. We, we've tried to change something, and then it's forced another change onto us, because we've been badly handled. And I think generally what's happening is, we're kind of focusing on the bits that we're building as we go along. But we're not thinking about how these bits fit together. And then this is causing problems for us. And this is much more interesting than building a duck. I didn't bring it here today to show you how to build a duck. This is a problem that I'm really quite interested in. So I want to start over. But I want to start over by focusing on this kind of problem. So, hello, my name's John. Welcome to the talk. This is about ducks that are driving and ducks are very muscular, obviously. And then let's build a duck. But actually, I'm not going to build a duck again from scratch. I'll get a bit competitive. Instead, I'll just tell you what problem I came across. I worked as a contractor in London, and I had a client, and they had previously built a duck, and they called me in to make some changes to it. And they had a piece of code that looked like this, and this is the thing that was responsible for quacking. And it's fine, it works very well, but they were saying the requirements are, are slightly different. We don't just want to quack. We want to quack loudly, and we want to quack quietly. I thought, this is a great contract, this is a nice, easy change. So I took the quark method, and that, that's never going to happen in isolation. I didn't have soft quark, so I just renamed the method to that. And then I added a new method for loud quark. And that worked. And I was about to go and collect my big pile of contract of cash and go home, and I thought, I'd better see what else is affected by this change. So I ran the test suite, and it looked like this. If you haven't seen our spec before, I mean, the green dots mean everything is working fine, and then crucially at the end, it says zero failures. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense. I've gone and I've taken the method out and replaced it with two new methods, but everything keeps working. So either the code is not used in the first place, in which case I can just delete it. But the test is wrong. So I did some grepping, and I found some code that looked a bit like this. Um, crucially, there's a line in here which calls the old quark method. So the code was in use, which means that the test must have been wrong. It's a bit of a surprise because this client was very good about testing. So I had a look at the test with this piece of code and it looked like this. And the problem here is this expect line. So when we write this line, it effectively adds a receiver for that quark method onto the object quarky bit here. So it changes the interface before we run the code. Now, you can avoid this. In our spec 3, for example, we use an instance double, it'll raise an exception if you try and do this. My concern is not that we can't avoid this kind of problem. My concern is it's all too easy to have this kind of problem and not notice, because as you saw before, the tests all passed. Around this time, I was playing with Go quite a lot, and I thought, this is the kind of thing that you can't get wrong in Go. So I thought, how are you writing Go? So I'm going to show you some Go code. Don't worry if you don't know any Go. The code should be pretty simple. I'll try and explain it as we go along. Um, but I'm going to write the same thing in Go. And I'm going to start with the duck brain. Now, I'm declaring it as a struct, which is a little bit like declaring a class. Um, and I'm saying it's got a single attribute called quarky bit, which is a type quarker. I'll come back to this type quarker in a moment. But before that, I'm going to add the method onto our duck brain. And we do it like this, and we add the say hello method on. Um, and all that does is call the quack on the quarky bit. So I'm going to come back to this quacker. Now, because this is Go, Everything has to be typed, and I've said that type this is quacker, and because this is go again, I'm going to write quacker as an interface, and we do it like this. And all this says is that we have an interface, it's got a single method called quack, it takes no arguments, returns nothing. And interfaces in Go are a little bit like interfaces in Java, or maybe protocols in Clojure, or various other similar constructs in other languages. You can't instantiate an interface directly. All you're doing is saying that something that implements this interface is guaranteed to have these methods inside it. Okay, so let's write something that implements this interface. So I'm going to write something called Bink, which is a little bit like an empty class here. And I'm going to add a method onto it called Quark. 
and all this does is print a standard R. It says blank. Okay, this is pretty much the equivalent of the original Ruby code I showed you. So we can stick it all together now. Right? We can instantiate a new big object, and then we can instantiate a new dot brain object, and we can set the attribute of quacky bit to be as big. And then finally, we can call, say, hello on this brain object, and that will call the quack object on the beak, and that will just print quack out the standard eye. All works very fine. Now, I'm going to make the same change to the Go code that I made to Ruby code. So we have this beak, and we've got a single quack method. I'm going to replace it with soft quack, and then add a new method called loud quack. Exactly the same change to made to the Ruby code. Okay, so what happens next? Well, Go to compile language, so we try and compile it, and it says something a little bit like this. It's saying you can't make that change. Because we're trying to take beak and pass it into the duck brain, and duck brain expects something to type quacker, it'll check beak against the interface quacker, and it's saying we don't need that interface, we're missing a method. We're missing a method here called quack. So in this case, I can think, well, the interface is out of date. I need to update the interface to match the implementation because the implementation is more correct. So we go back to the interface and we just change it to have these two methods inside it. Now we try to compile it, we get a different error. It's now saying you can't <coughs> call quack on something of type quacker because that's not in the interface anymore. In fact, if you go back to the code, you can see we're still calling the old quack method, and that's no longer valid. So I kind of like this. I particularly like that the compiler tells me how to break stuff. Now, I don't know about you lot, but I break stuff all the time. And it's really nice that the compiler help me out and say, hey, you made a mistake. But more than that, the compiler's also hinting about how to fix things. It's not just saying, it's broken, you're on your own. It's saying, it's broken and you missed this method. You should have implemented it or you can't call this anymore. But there's another nice thing about the Go approach. When I was writing duck bread, I wasn't thinking about beak. I wasn't thinking about implementation of anything. And likewise, when I was writing B, I wasn't thinking about blood brain. They're only connected through this interface in the middle. And even better than that, the interface is tangible. I can have a look at my code and I can say, oh look, these are the messages that flow from duck brain to beak between these two objects. So I spoke to a friend of mine, a guy called Jakob. Um, he writes Ruby. He also was learning Go at the time. He's a bit of a polyglot. Uh, unfortunately, I've lost the exact chat transcript. Um, it was in Skype. You can never search history and never easily. But the conversation went a little bit like this. I called him up and said, hey, Jakob, wouldn't it be great with interfaces in Ruby? And he said, in Ruby, this is easy. Just go and write it. And I had to admit he had a point. It is quite easy to go and implement. So I went back to my original duck brain. And I thought, OK, how do we check the type of quacky bit here? My first approach was a bit naive. I wrote some code like this. I said, I'm going to check a response to quack. This is just your standard duck typing. And if it doesn't implement that, I thought, OK, I'll raise it an error, in this case, an interface error. And I thought, this is great. All right, clever. I've just implemented no method error, <laughs> except that it's less efficient and gives me less information. <laughs> Probably not the right approach. OK, so I went back and thought about the problem some more. And I thought, OK, really, there are contracts we're putting out between objects. And on one half of the contract, we have an object that promises to provide those methods. And on the other half, we've got an object that promises to only ever use those methods. So inspired by this, I wrote a gem called Lawyer, the idea being that Lawyer will enforce these contracts for me. And to write a contract, it's a little bit like writing an interface in Go. Um, you write a class that inherits from the Lawyer gem. And then inside that, you write declarations for the methods you want. So in this case, we'll write a declaration that says there's going to be a method called Quack. And the zero here means it takes no arguments into that method. OK, so how do we use it? If we go back to our quacky bit, all I need to do to say this user interface is add a line at the bottom, add a declaration, and it looks like this. And I'm saying this implements the interface called quacker. OK, so what happens when I make my change again? So if I change quack into soft quack and then add loud quack in, like we did before, what happens is when you load this file, this line at the end gets run, the, the declaration of implementing the interface. And it, of course, we don't implement this anymore. So it stops. It raises an exception. And it says, you can't do this. Quacky bit does not implement this interface. And then it goes on to tell me why. It says, you're missing a method, and this method is called quack. So this is very similar to the way that Go worked. 
So then we go back to interface and we think, well, actually, the class is right, the interface is wrong here, the contract is wrong here. So we can just change it and add the two methods into there. So now our class loads properly. So that's one half of the contract. What about the other half, the person that's calling it? Well, I can't enforce it in the compiler in Ruby. So I thought the next best thing for me is going to be RSpec. RSpec is a tool I use a lot to, to check that things are valid. So I'm going to write a spec which validates this contract for me. So if we write a spec for DuckBrain, uh, we had this duck nearby method, so I'll write a spec for that. OK, so inside here, what we're going to do is we're going to call DuckBrain, and then we're going to check some behavior. So we're going to call this say hello method. And then we're going to make sure that something has received quack. But I'm not quite sure what this something is yet. So I'm going to follow the go approach. I'm going to say, OK, we're going to have something called quacker. And we're going to pass that into DuckBrain when we start DuckBrain up. And then we're going to check that we call the method in that. So what is this quack that we're passing in? Well, I wrote a helper for this called contract double. It's a little bit like instance double in, in RSpec3. Um, what it does is it creates an object that's got the same interface as anything that implements that contract. So all the methods in the contract will be available in this, uh, in this double object. And it will check method arity as well. So it will say, you know, you need to have the same number of arguments. And it checks named arguments as well in Ruby 2. So that's what we create. And we pass it into DuckBrain. And then we run our DuckBrain code, and then later on we can say, I want to make sure you call the right methods in this thing that I gave to you. Now, of course, I'm still calling the old interface. I'm calling quack, which we took out of interface. We replaced it with soft quack and loud quack. So what happens when we run this spec? Well, we get a failure, of course, is what you expect. And it's saying, you can't call this. You cannot call quack on this double, because it doesn't exist. It doesn't respond to that message. So this is kind of like the Go code to me. In the Go, I was quite happy because the compiler told me when I broke stuff. I thought it was pretty useful. We don't really have a compiler in a typical sense in Ruby, but I've kind of faked it by saying the tool chain tells me when I break stuff. And this is pretty good. And it's important to note that this is still Ruby. And this is still just duct typing. But I've taken it and I've made it strong duct typing. Now, if you go to the internet and you look up the difference between strong typing and weak typing, you're going to find that it means many different things. It basically means what someone wants it to mean to win an argument. So here's what I think it means to win an argument. It, actually, I think it means two things to me. The first thing is that the tool chain is helping to enforce the types. This is not like type annotations where it's up to you to check it. It's not just documentation. It will actually break, tell you early on when you break something, when you, when you have something that doesn't implement the contract properly. The next thing that's important to me is we check before runtime. So duct typing is a really lovely idea, but quite often, it manifests itself by running a production and saying, you tried to call this method, and it's not there, and I'm going to helpfully crash now and tell you it's all broken. And that's not what I want. I want it to break as early as possible so that we have time to fix things. So we have this thing, and then I thought, is it actually useful? And initially, I was thinking, yeah, this is great. And I was thinking things like, I've got more confidence that my, product, uh, my code will not break in production. And it's not going to break because we've got this extra type checking in place. And then I thought about it some more. And I thought, well, this kind of interface problem, I've seen it maybe a few times. And I've been writing Ruby for about eight years now. So on average, that's once every couple of years, maybe. And worse than that, I've seen it happen, but it's always been caught really early on. It's very obvious when you make this kind of break. I've never seen this get into production. So I've done all this work. But I've solved the wrong problem. I've solved a problem that doesn't really exist. And I was feeling a little bit down at this point. But it could be worse. I mean, you guys have listened to me for 20 minutes telling you the wrong thing. <laughs> so anyway, I was a bit down. But then I thought about it some more. And I thought, well, Go is doing more than just telling me that it's broken. The other thing it's doing is it's hinting about how to fix things. And I thought, that's cool. I've got that as well. You know, it's not just telling me that it's broken, but it's giving me some hints as to how to fix it. That's kind of useful. And then I thought, when I'm writing objects, they don't need to know about each other anymore. They only need to know about this interface in between. And then I also thought, well, interfaces are tangible again. I can look at my code, and I can think, hey, I can look and see a list of messages that are going from one object to another. And this is quite nice. I quite like this. So I want to start over, and I want to bear this in mind, and I want to look at how it's changed the way I wrote code. Hello, my name's John. Welcome to this talk on duct typing. I want to look at how this drives our code forward now. 
I want to look at how it changes my coding, because this is obviously a picture of me photoshopped a little bit. OK, so let's build a duck. Now, I want to focus on a little bit of detail here. And I want to build, there's quite a lot of code coming up. Uh, I'm going to try and step through it slowly. But I want you to pay attention as to the way that I'm being driven forward as I write the code. So we had this bit of a duck before. And we got the eye here, and it's looking around. And I thought, well, how is this really going to work? So I imagine the eye is kind of constantly sending image data back. And it's going to go to something which is going to interpret that image data. So I'm going to send it to something called the visual cortex. And that's going to do things like shape detection and proximity detection and so on. And then when this thinks there's a duck nearby, it's going to send a message to the brain. It's going to say, hey, brain, there's a duck nearby. And the brain will be responsible for the next part, which is probably going to be quacking at it. So it's going to trigger these other processes to make the quack happen. OK, so I'm going to build this from scratch. Now, when I started before with drawing the duck, I could just put the bits of the duck onto the page. And that works well when you're drawing stuff. But when you're writing code, you can't just put stuff nowhere. We need a container to hold everything together. So I'm going to start by writing a duck class. And I'm going to start by writing a spec, because I'm a, I'm a grown-up developer. <laughs> And I'm going to start with just one little piece of functionality. So I'm going to say, when we create a duck, I want it to also create a visual cortex for us to use. OK, so how do we do this? Well, we're going to have a block of code here, which creates a new duck for us. And when we do that, we're going to say, we expect this to also create a visual cortex object. And then crucially, I'm going to say, with no arguments. I'm going to be very precise about what I expect to happen here. OK, so we run this spec, and it failed for a very boring reason, because we haven't written any code yet. Um, so I'm going to go and write the duck class. So we start with an empty class, and I'm thinking, OK, what do I need to do? What's the smallest amount of work I need to do to make this pass? So I'll write an initializer, which creates a visual cortex object. Now, of course, this fails because there's no visual cortex. We get a name error at this point. So test is telling me the next thing to do is go and write visual cortex. Now, if we have a little think about what Visual Cortex does, it says, when there's a duck nearby, I'm going to tell the brain about this. So I'm going to implement that very small slice of functionality. So let's start writing a test for that. So this is about notifying the brain. I'm missing some context here. I'm going to imagine we set this up so that we are faking the image data coming from the eye, which shows a duck nearby. This is the context in which we're writing this test. OK, so how do we do this? So we, we create a new Visual Cortex object. Um, I'm going to call a method called run. I've got this kind of idea of just running in a thread on its own, constantly proce processing the image data coming in. And then we'll say, when we run this with a duck nearby, with the right image coming in, then we expect it to call the brain and say, hey, there's a duck nearby. OK, so let's go and write some code for that. We have the test sitting here. Um, so we'll write a run method, and it's the smallest amount of work it can do, which says, hey, brain, there's a duck nearby. OK, we have a problem here. I'm referencing brain, but I haven't actually written this yet. It doesn't exist yet. And in fact, if we go back to the spec, I did the same thing. I was saying, I expect you to call this on brain, but we haven't written brain yet. We haven't got any idea what this thing is. So I'm going to use a similar trick from before. I'm going to pass something in to the initializer when I create it. I'm going to say, when I create a visual cortex, I'm going to give it an object, and I'm going to check that you call something on this object. So what is this thing we're going to pass in? Well, it's a contract double, of course. It's a thing that I used before. And I'm going to create a new contract, and I'm going to call this contract greeter, um, because this is to do with greeting nearby ducks. OK, this spec will now fail because there's no contracts greeter. So let's go and have a look at writing that. We write the same as before. We just write a class and inherits from the lawyer gem. And then we'll put a single declaration there saying, you will have a method called duck nearby, which takes no arguments. OK. So we have our spec working now. We, we have this thing named. And then we pass it into Visual Cortex. But this fails because we haven't written the initializer in Visual Cortex to take this argument. So the test is saying, you can't do this. You cannot pass an argument here. So we have to go and change that. So we go back to our Visual Cortex class. We need to add an initializer, which takes an argument. And in fact, this will be a brain that we then try and call later for duck nearby. OK, at this point, when we run the spec for Visual Cortex, it passes. Everything is great, except we haven't written the brain yet. So a little bit of our code is working. We're quite happy with that. But we still have a chunk to go. 
And in fact, we don't need to worry about this because the test is going to tell us this. If we go back to our duck spec, you can see that we said we're going to create it and we're going to create it with no arguments. And this will now fail because visual cortex cannot be created with no arguments. It expects a particular argument to be passed in. And in fact, you get an error like this coming up, which is saying you can't do this. OK, so what do we do at this point? Well, we said that we're going to call it with no arguments, and we know this is wrong. So what are we going to call it with? Well, I've written this in such a way that you can just give it the name of a contract. You can say, I want you to call me with anything that implements this particular contract. OK, so we look at implementing this code. We're going to say, we need to pass something in here. But what's this thing going to be? We don't have anything to pass in at this point. So we need to add another thing. So we go back to our spec. This is saying, we already expect to create a visual cortex. But now we need to create another thing as well. So we're going to say, we expect you to create a brain object. Um, and it's the same format. We expect you to create a brain with no arguments. OK, so now we can go back to our code, the actual code. And we can say, right, let's create a new brain and pass it in. Now, at this point, of course, the whole thing fails again because we haven't defined brain. So we can do this quickly. We can say, OK, write a new class called brain. And then we run the spec. And the spec fails because it says, you don't match this interface. We expect you to pass something of type contracts greeter into uh, the visual cortex. But the thing that you're passing in doesn't meet that contract. It has no duck nearby method. So this is the thing that we need to go and implement on brain to satisfy the spec. OK, so we can write a spec for brain. We can say it greets ducks nearby. So we'll create a new brain object. And then we're going to call duck nearby on it. And then we need to expect some kind of behavior. So here we're going to expect that we call the quacker and actually generate a quack. OK, except that we don't have quacker yet. So this whole process repeats. We can say, OK, we haven't got a quacker. We're going to create one. We're going to pass it into brain. We're going to create an interface or a contract that specifies what the behavior is from this. And then we're going to go and find that when we create the duck object, it's not passing this into brain. And then we're going to repeat the whole process again and again and again until all of our tests pass. And when the tests pass, we can be pretty confident that we know what's happening. And of course, what we're doing here is letting the tests guide us through this process. This is just TDD, right? This is nothing particularly new, except that we're adding contracts into the mix. Now, this is great for writing new code, but writing new code is easy. I'm not really that interested in writing code. I find that changing code is much, much harder, because not only do you have to put in your new functionality, but you need to not break existing stuff. So I think it's really important that we focus on making change easier rather than making writing new stuff easier. So how do we make change easier? Well, we already do this using TDD. We use TDD to make refactoring easier. And in fact, more specifically, I think we use TDD to make refactoring of objects easier. So we can go in and say, I'm going to change the way this object works. But by adding contracts into the mix, I think we make refactoring of messages easier as well. So when we get our object working the way we want, we can think about the way these objects interact. So we can think about the messages between the different objects. And then if necessary, we can go and change the contract. We can say, the way these two things talk is not the way that I expect. And this will generate a load of failing tests. Well, it will if you break something anyway. And then we can go and just fix those things. And then we can be in a nice working situation again and start the process again and think about the messages some more. So we'll look at two types of changes that this supports. One is just changing the message that we're going to send between objects. So we had this contract before, and it defines a single duck nearby method that takes no arguments. And I'm thinking, this isn't quite right. I don't want to take no arguments. I want to know how close it is. So I'm going to add a named argument onto there called distance. So I've changed the contract now. So what happens when we run the specs? Well, first of all, you can't even load the classes up because we had this declaration saying that something will already implement this contract. And in fact, it breaks. It says, you no longer implement the contract. There's a problem. You don't have this named argument in your duck nearby method. On the other side of the equation, if we have something that's using this contract double and trying to call something, we get a different type of failure coming up saying, you can no longer call this method without any arguments. You, you know, we expect you to pass something in here, something in with a name. So we can make these changes to the way two objects speak, and we can rely on the specs to come and tell us if there's any implications of that change. The other nice thing we can do is we can swap out implementations very easily. A little caveat here, they need to implement the same interface. So if we've got two things with the same interface, we can change one for the other without breaking any code. So 
we had this idea of the brain, and we talked to the brain and said, there's a duck nearby, but actually that's the wrong abstraction. As we develop our system, we might think, we're going to break the brain up into more detailed pieces. We have something like the frontal lobe being responsible for this high-level decision-making. So what we do is we make this implement the same interface as something before, as the brain did before. And then we can go back to our duck class, which originally created the brain and passed it to the visual cortex, and we can just replace it with frontal lobe. And assuming these things have got the same interface, they have the same contract, then we can do this and break nothing. And the tests, if they pass, will tell us that this is a fine thing to do. You know, we, no problem doing this. And if you don't have the same contract, the test will blow up and say, this is not a valid thing to do. So again, we're relying on the test here to tell us what to do next. And what I find is I've learned to trust this. I can trust the tests to tell me what to write next. So what happens is I start on a little isolated piece of functionality within my system. And I focus on this, and I get the test to pass for that particular thing. And I start throwing things into this contract to say, remind me that I need to write this later. I need to send this message to some other part of the system. So we focus on these little isolated things like thinking about the bigger picture. And then we focus on the messages. Now, this is probably the most important thing I want to say today, that we start to focus on the messages between parts of the system. So this is a really big idea, and it's a really important idea. And if you look at Alan Kay, Alan Kay was the guy that coined the term object-oriented. And then later on, he showed a little bit of regret for doing this, because in his words, it put the focus too much on objects. And that's not the most important thing. For him, the big idea is messaging. And if you forget everything else I said today, just think the big idea is messaging. We want to think about not just the bits of system we're building, but how these things talk to each other. OK, so let's recap. What have we done today? Well, first of all, we built a duck, and we did it pretty badly. But this is quite interesting, because as we built it, we noticed some accidental coupling creeping in. And I said that this is caused by ignoring the connections between objects. And another way of saying that it is caused by ignoring the messaging between objects. So that's not where we want to be. So I took duct typing, really standard duct typing, and I supercharged it so that we can focus on the connections between objects. And then we get this to generate errors when we break those connections. But that's not the whole story. What we did next is we took those errors and we used it to drive our development forward. And by approaching coding in this style, we reduce this accidental coupling. I think that this helps avoid ball of mud code. And to me, ball of mud code is the problem I see most often when working in Ruby systems. You get these systems that grow quite large, and you can't touch one part of it without that change rippling through and affecting lots of other code. So we fix this. I think this is a big win for everybody. So this is strong duct type driven development, and why I think it's a good idea. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>